All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's see, Bobo, announcements? What do we have? We have a quiz coming today. I have already submitted that. Uh, you can come the Yes, we have a new quiz on interviewing and interview guides. It should take no more than five minutes. It's uh, like the previous one, multiple choice. Uh, thank you, Bobo, for designing that. Um, and we've started great. <laughs> Or not? Well, I, yeah, that's between you and them. Um, we started grading the lit review assignment, and so we, we don't have that. We just started. We don't have that yet. There was one thing that I wanted to mention, though. Um, I uh, admittedly have only looked at very few examples, but um, I think it would be useful to. Um, I encourage you to force you to revisit those, maybe add a bit more clarity to, uh, to the writing. So the, the big issue that I've seen so far is an unclear definition of the problem and the knowledge gap and the work that you're proposing and what the hook is, why it's important to, to fill that knowledge gap and why your work presumably uh, fills that. So I haven't seen these clearly. Uh, I, you know, looked at examples that um, were all over the place in, in some sense and weren't clearly articulating. You know, what is the problem that you're working on? What is the gap in our current knowledge about that problem, etc.? Like these aspects that we talked about in class. Sam, is this a new assignment for the iteration of the course? Uh, this is, uh, it's an old assignment, slightly tweaked. Why do you ask? I'm just curious, like, if you found, like, these look different from the, like, submissions you got in previous iterations of the course. It's somewhat tweaked, so it's some, it looks somewhat different. Uh, yes. Uh, last time I offered this assignment was before I was insisting on this problem gap hook format for um, the write-up. Uh, so those were slightly differently structured. So in previous iterations, like these things still weren't there, but you weren't asking for them. So yeah, um, yeah. So I, you know, I don't really. I, I'm not strict on the pro problem gap book, you know, heuristic or structure. Uh, as long as there's a clear problem gap, you know, hook somewhere, right? You know, there could be anything. I don't really care how you do this. I, what I'm commenting on right now is, you know, I, I want to read these. And you know, if somebody's asking me to, or you know, if Bobo is asking me to summarize this back to him, I want to be able to tell him, you know, in just three words, you know, what is the problem, what is our, our gap in our knowledge or understanding of the problem, uh, and what does this uh, paper, fic, uh, fictional, uh, fictional paper, do and to to address that problem? So I want I want to be able to do that, uh, and some of the examples I looked at. I, you know, e even after spending lots of time like reading them, I had a hard time pinpointing, you know, what is the actual problem? You know, is it this? Is it that? Is it something else? You know, there were lots of things going on in the write ups. So I want to be able to pinpoint the problem and, you know, the gap in our understanding or knowledge of the problem. Uh, and I think any reader would want that, right? So, you know, it's not about the problem gap hook heuristic, but it's, you know, about being able to clearly articulate what the problem is, why it's important. And what don't we know about it uh, that the proposed work uh, tries to fill? So we're still, you know, we're going to look at more examples, but I, we may ask you to, uh, you know, maybe or we may or may not ask you to resubmit uh, uh, an annotated version of the things you submitted, where you, where you yourselves, you know, highlight the parts of the write-up that describe the problem, you know, and the knowledge gap, and so on just to force you to you know, identify them uh, and articulate them. Um, and so I guess one useful maybe way to think about this as you're writing um, is starting from the structure and then filling in the details rather than maybe the other way around. So like I, I would encourage you to think about you know, what is in one or two sentences the problem. You know, could you articulate that in one or two sentences? Uh, and what is in one or two sentences, bullet list if you will, um, our uh, current state of understanding of the problem. What's the knowledge gap? Like, could you do that in as little as one sentence? 
to kind of create this wireframe structure for your argument. And then you fill in you know, all of the details of the prior work and how it all fits together and your know, theory. Uh, this was particularly challenging here because it had this extra dimension of signaling theory. You know, how do you fit that in? Uh, how do you talk about that? How do you use that, if at all? Um, but I think you're starting from the wireframe and then building it up is sort of an easier way to, to arrive at the end result rather than, you know, a different way of doing this. Okay, so we'll keep reading those and give you more feedback on them and whatnot. Um, I realized that, uh, side note, uh, and no, I didn't go to Eat Unique today. I had a different, oh, wait, it was a box launch from Eat Unique. Ah. Darn it. <laughs> so I guess it counts. Um, okay, so who knows? We're in for a, uh, another rant today. Um, I, I realized that a side effect uh, of this class, you know, and I, and I started talking about this before, um, about stealing great writing and examples of great study designs from the many we will be reading and dissecting and thinking about over the course of the semester. Uh, that also applies to writing specifically. Like I, I think we have an opportunity to also improve our writing of our own research papers by you know, being very deliberate about kind of how we practice doing this and uh, how we read other people's writing. So um, this is a, an attempt to do more of that uh, this year than was done in the past, also for was more on writing. Okay, uh, but that's all uh, the each unique rant. So, for today, what I'd like to do is, you know, we talked about setting up and designing and running these interviews uh, as a way to collect data. Um, and we really didn't talk, talk much about what we do with that data once we collect it. Um, so that's, you know, the second half of the interviewing discussion is how we analyze all of this data that we're collecting from the interviews. It could similarly be data that we're collecting from surveys, and we will spend probably the next couple of lectures or so starting Thursday on survey design and analysis and whatnot. Uh, so this will sort of come in handy there as well. Um, I'm basing this primarily on a chapter from the Squall Data Data Analysis book, which I have shared with you. Um, you should all have access to that Google Drive folder with all of these reading materials. This is a screenshot of the contents of that relevant folder uh, shared with you in, in Google Drive with all of these readings. The chapter is in there as well, along with lots of other useful uh, things that I encourage you to read um, that you know, describe, kind of, I've curated the best readings I found to date on this topic of qualitative analysis as, you know, as a way for you to find the most relevant ones when you, when you need them. Um, okay, and so we will be touching on several other ones of these, but not all of them, obviously, because we won't have time just today. So as always, I encourage you to go and, and look at this uh, offline. We'll talk a little bit about trustworthiness and credibility in qualitative uh, analysis and qualitative data, um, and so how we might go about achieving this. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for a hands-on coding, depending on how much each unique ranting I go on. Um, or we'll do that at the beginning of class next time, so we'll see. Okay, so the, you've done these interviews, right? You have, even for homework, you've done interviews, you've done them for research maybe, uh, or you've ran a survey with open-ended questions. Um, if you've done interviews, you have access to the transcripts of those interviews. Uh, so now you have a body of text you know, either from open-ended survey responses or from interview transcripts. And the question is, how do you make some sense of this volume of text that you've accumulated? How do you do that in a systematic way? And then how do you describe and write up the results of your analysis in a research paper? So we're gonna talk about this um, qualitative analysis, qualitative content analysis technique today. Um, right. Um, so there's two steps. Uh, fundamentally uh, in this process. The first one is some um, process of abstraction, right? Because you will invariably have accumulated larger amounts of data than you know, are, are, are probably necessary for 
answering your specific research questions. In any case, there are more than is feasible to report on in an actual paper. So there needs to be some level of abstraction and summarization of all of this data that you're collecting. Um, and this is often referred to as coding. That's the technical term, coding the data, the transcripts, for example, coding it to abstract it, to, to make it easier to then analyze. Um, so you know, coding is typically a way to characterize or summarize the data. We'll see a few more examples in a minute. But think of this as a way of abstracting or summarizing. The, that by itself is probably not very interesting if you stop there. So typically what happens as a second step in this process is some um, pattern seeking, theme finding, theory building step following this coding abstraction step. Um, so the point here is that you use these codes, uh, first level abstractions to um, synthesize something more interesting than simply enumerating all of the things you found. Right? There needs to be some level of interpretation and synthesis and ideally theorizing maybe, uh, maybe your goal is actually to build or craft some theory from uh, all of these observations. It need not be, but it could be. But in any case, you need to do some sort of interpretation and synthesis of all of this data, because otherwise it's probably not very interesting if all you do is simply, you know, enumerate all of the instances of the codes you found. Um, so this is, uh, right, this is the harder step, uh, the sort of, you know, the aggregation pattern theme finding stuff. Okay, but let me start with coding. So coding is labeling, if you will. It's a way of abstracting or summarizing the input data. There's different ways in which you can think about coding. It could be purely a descriptive label that you assign to a paragraph of text, a sentence. It could be a sentence. It could be parts of a sentence. It could be a whole paragraph. It could be you know any uh, unit, uh, but it's a way of summarizing it descriptively. Uh, just uh, here, for example, the code businesses on the right hand side uh, summarizes the basic topic of this passage of text that describes a number of businesses um, you know, in the vicinity of uh, whatever where the interview he was talking about. Okay. Or uh, you could, uh, so in vivo coding is a way of coding that extracts uh, quotes from the actual passage of text um, as the, the code itself. So here, you know, the, the actual quote is, I hated school last year, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, hated school can become a code. Uh, that's a way of summarizing the sentence. Uh, freshman year was awful, I hated it. This year is a lot better, actually. I don't know why. Right, so this year is better, you know, could be another code, et cetera. Uh, I stopped caring about what other people thought, uh, whatever else. And stop caring could be a code. So in vivo coding means you're using quotes from the actual text verbatim as your codes, but you know they're short uh, because they're meant to be summaries. Yes. So I understand the idea, but what about context of? So if I take a look at the code and I don't have context of where the code of where the context is used. Um, yeah. Yes. So the question is, can it be dangerous to do this without context? Most definitely. But usually um, you do have all of the context because you were the one who conducted the interviews in the first place and collected all of this data. You and your collaborators on the research project. Um, so typically, it's not a sort of an independent set of researchers coding uh, data or transcripts without context. And even when that's the case, you still have access to all of the transcripts. So here, I'm just giving you, you know, one sentence pulled out of context for the sake of illustrating this. But you know, you would have the entire transcript. You know what the research questions are. You you know you know what else was discussed, etc. So typically, you'd have a lot more context if not all of the context, because you were the one that actually ran the interview in the first place. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, or you could be coding for process words. So that's typically, you know, uh, you'd be extracting the ING uh, words and things like this. Uh, well, that's one problem that my score is pretty small. So if you say one thing to one person and then they decide to tell two people, then those two people tell two people in one period, everybody else knows, you know, spreading rumors could be the one way of summarizing this uh, phrase, this sentence. Okay. Uh, and you're focusing on, on process words and you're using verbs to do this. Um, or you could be coding for emotions, for example, you know, this all depends on what your actual uh, you know, research questions and goals are for that particular study. So you could be coding for, you know, I just hated it when he got awarded with the honor. I mean, we're pre uh, praising mediocrity now. Never mind that you've accomplished what you've accomplished isn't worth squat. It's all about who you know and, and the good old boys network. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, emotions displayed by the interviewee here are uh, they hated it and so bitterness about uh, what happened. Um, or you could be coding for you know, values, attitudes, beliefs, similarly. Uh, okay, so you know, there's lots of ways, lots of kinds of codes you could be applying to your text. They're all, they're all valid, they're all useful in some way. Um, one decision that you will have to make often is whether you begin with some set of predefined uh, codes or uh, whether you start from scratch. When might this come up? Can anybody think of a scenario where you'd have to say, uh, start from a predefined set of codes, possibly incomplete? Elijah. If you're replicating another uh, study's methodology, they may have a code book that you can use as a starting point. Yeah, definitely. So if you're like starting from some prior study, where there is a code book available, you know, you could just be reusing that, right? Uh, you know, on some new data to see if you're discovering some of the same things or some new things. Uh, that's a perfectly valid scenario. Anything else? Can you think of any other scenario? Cough, right. theory, cough. <laughs> Yeah. Just a question. Do we have like any examples of like here's a full interview and with the coding done so we can look at like what that would look like for an example? Yes, we uh, we shall be coding a transcript hands on. I have example transcripts in the, this folder. The first item there is actual verbatim transcripts, parts of transcripts from actual interviews. Coded transcripts or uncoded transcripts? Uncoded transcripts, we'll code them together. Um, I can also share a number of coded transcripts from some of our own research studies in our group. I'm happy to do that. I don't have them at hand right now, but we have plenty. So I'm happy to do that offline. Yep. Uh, Courtney, you're on the hook. I saw that hand before you dropped it, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say um, a, another situation where you might start from a predefined list of codes is where if there's like specific aspects of the experience that you want to try to identify in the interviews, like when we were looking at toxicity, we knew there were specific characteristics like when or who was the target that we wanted to try to look at. And so we knew that we wanted to code for those things when we saw them and the responses are in the data. That makes sense. Yep. Thank you. That's a good example. What else? Cough again, theory, cough again. So, okay. So let me, let me say this differently. We talked a lot about qualitative interviews as a research method that is typically used in what kind of research? Is it the social constructivist or is it the objectivist? Right. But I think I also 
tried to insist that it need not be the only way you could use interviews. So for example, you know, if you're using interviews in a more you know, objectivist way, which you can, um, you know, there's some starting theory that you're looking to confirm to some extent, right, uh, in the new data that you're collecting. So you could already have lots of codes from that theory, right, that you're looking for, you know, in this in this new data. Um, another scenario is when what else did we did we say? Um, how, how and when do we analyze? data that we collect through interviews do we do it at the end when we're done with all the interviews do we do it after every interview do we do do we just never do it and give up when do we do it when do we do analysis it would depend i guess kind of on the structure of the study like we've seen examples where you take a subset you interview and then use that to create a better methodology for the second larger yeah, so last time I insisted on this being a good model to follow, where analysis and data collection happen iteratively, and there's some analysis that happens, you know, after some amount of data collection, before more data collection happens. So it could very well be that this initial analysis results in some probably incomplete set of codes or code book, um, and you then you know, start from that when you're analyzing the second round of data that you've collected you know through a second round of uh, interviews uh, and so on and so forth right so you know you needn't start from scratch every time and, and that's okay um, this may or may not be on the upcoming quiz also that's just fyi okay ah we actually talked about that very good um yeah very good Yes, this is the other kind of, sort of theory driven or hypothesis driven coding where you start from some, uh, you could have a predefined list of codes um, that comes from, uh, from some theory that you're looking to test hypothesis from. So we just talked about that. Um, okay, yeah, so general considerations to summarize uh, uh, deductive versus inductive, like you start from scratch and let you know, code the actual raw data and come up with the list of codes. Um, commonly you do, um, sometimes you don't. Right? Sometimes you start with some initial start list and you extend, refine, etc. that list is needed. Um, right, analysis concurrent with data collection, that's always a good idea, rather than waiting until the very end to discover that perhaps you should have asked more or fewer or different questions and you've missed out on these opportunities. Um, yes, and clear operational definitions are indispensable so that all of the codes, right? Remember, because codes are, or labels, if you will, they're just that, they're summaries, abstractions. So you need to have some clear operational definition for what counts as an instance of that code. You know, maybe what doesn't with examples or counter examples. Uh, so that you yourself can apply that consistently over time uh, and so that other researchers you know your collaborators or you know, other people that might be looking at the same data once you release it could arrive at comparable interpretations of that data so this is really important uh, this i'll talk more about this this is a really important issue of credibility when we talk about quantitative research so the one with numbers and statistics and whatnot we typically talk about threats to validity when we talk about qualitative research so you know, qualitative analysis of interview data and things like that we typically talk about threats to credibility it's another sort of the technical term that's used in this context is more often credibility not validity um, because it's not that there's a clear right or wrong answer with these because there's sort of you know often subjective interpretations. Okay, so it's it's hard to talk about it's invalid in that sense. Um, yes, and what's the level of detail? You know, could be uh, you know every portion could be parts of a phrase, could be entire blocks of text, could be anything you know in between. It's up to you. Uh, just a few examples. 
courtesy of Courtney, who was kind enough to donate them. This is from uh, her recent ICSI paper. Um, so these are printouts of uh, issue discussions from open source projects on GitHub, literal printouts, I guess four per page to save on paper. Um, and you will see how uh, Courtney has annotated, interesting, the, my little pointer does not carry <laughs> over. Oh, there we go, I see, interesting. Um, you see how, for example, Courtney highlighted parts of these paragraphs, right, that she coded and, you know, maybe discarded other ones that were irrelevant for the study. Um, you can also see how there are these post-it notes with the particular code that applies. And presumably there's a stack of sheets of paper that are all instances of that code within each of these piles. So that's an example of kind of the mechanics of the process. Um, here is from the same study, uh, part of the actual spreadsheet or, or file defining all of these codes. So, you know, we have a list of codes and we have operational definitions and we wrote those down so that, you know, not just Courtney can consistently do this the next time she sees an example, uh, but also that, you know, we can all agree among the co-authors of, you know, what constitutes an instance of, of that code. Okay, any, any questions on coding? Sam? Yes, I'm, I might be like jumping too far ahead, but I'm like, I'm thinking about like, like studies I've seen with interviews before and they're like, oh, we, you know, we, like the theories, I guess, just feel like they are so much, would require so much higher level of detail than the codes that seem like you're describing. Um, I don't know, I, I think I'll just have to see an example in, in practice to see how it goes. So um, the, the coding is just the first part, is the part where we're simplifying the input data, this, it's reducing the search space, so that we can begin to make these uh, syntheses, abstractions, and, and find themes, and theorize, and draw hypotheses, and whatnot, find concepts and relationships between them. We can only begin to do that on this simplified, well, I mean, we could do that on the raw thing too, but it's a lot harder. You know, there's a lot more stuff to keep in your mind at any point in time. It's easier to think about these concepts and relationships between them and start to theorize, et cetera, et cetera, on these simpler abstractions, right? Of which the um, quotes are just instances, right? The other reason is, you know, often participants, uh, informants, interviewees, whatever, will talk about the same issues using just simply different words, right? So, you know, using the raw data is not useful in that sense, right? You want to be able to recognize that, you know, these are all instances of literally the same concept or whatever phenomenon or thing that people are mentioning. Uh, and you want to reason about those, right? Not about, you know, you want to be robust to, you know, variation in the particular words that people are using to describe the same concept. Yeah, I, I guess like to, to me, the closest thing that this it was like to something I've done before is like when like creating homework assignments, like I'll go through the assignments and I won't like assign any grades or take off any points or anything. And I just note all the like, I guess, mistakes that I see in like this one, all the mistakes I see in this one. And then I like build up a, a list of all the different kinds of things that I've seen. And then after that, then I go and assign point values to all those. Is that like kind of a similar idea? Yeah, I think that's a great example. I think this process you're describing of deriving a rubric scoring rubric for homework assignments is a great example of coding uh, with some synthesis afterwards. Because mm -hmm. you're sort of, yeah, you're kind of grouping them and, you know, classes of mistakes, et cetera. You're doing some some more aggregation and interpretation of the things you see. Yeah. I guess it feels different though, because in that case, I like, I know what I'm looking, I know what kind of things I want to code for, which is like mistakes, like things I want to take out points for. But is this, it seems like, I feel like it would be very difficult to come up with like, I don't even know where I would start with like, what, what the code, should the code look like? Yeah, so maybe, maybe the uh, example you're describing is more of the um, deductive coding 
flavor where there's some initial set of codes or there's some hypothesis, you know, the kinds of mistakes you're looking for. There's some underlying theory, if you will, about the mistakes people will make that you're going into this with and you're just looking to confirm that or define instances of that in your data, uh, more so than the end where you where you don't actually know what you know, these are going in and you're sort of discovering that from the ground up from the data directly. That's just my, that's how I see. I guess it, it see that. definitely feels inductive because like usually I have no idea what kind of mistakes I'm going to see and I'm like usually pretty surprised. It's like very different from the look that would have come up I, I see. Beforehand. But it's more like I know what a mistake looks like. Like I know, I, I know exactly what kind of things I'm looking for. I know when I see it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it feels, it feels less constructivist, right? Fair enough. So it's equally inductive. I mean, with interviews, you often, especially if you're conducting the interviews, you hear people say things a lot. And so from that, you begin to think about, at least in my experience, you begin to think about, okay, these are the things that are probably going to end up being codes or themes or things like that. So I think it makes a lot more sense when you're doing it than it can if you just think about abstract. Uh -huh. Uh, by the way, you can probably guess that um, we will ask you to code and analyze the interview transcripts for the interviews that you will have conducted for homework. Uh, and we'll, we'll think a bit more about how to make this less painful for everybody. You know. So we haven't really that one quite yet, but you're presumably still thinking about conducting or you've already conducted I know some of you have already conducted interviews for homework I'm assuming that this is ongoing okay so let's talk about the second step which is I think the more interesting one um, the first step was just sort of a simplification of the data now is where the interesting stuff starts to happen um, there's lots of uh, terms that this uh, goes by I'm following this Miles and Huberman and Saldana description from the uh, textbook chapter I mentioned in the beginning where they refer to this as pattern coding so you're going from these low level individual codes to some higher level aggregation and synthesis of these including you know relationships between them and whatnot grouping them into hierarchical structures and identifying relationships between them etc uh, maybe identifying causes and explanations for the phenomena, uh, theoretical constructs, lots of things like that. Um, there's another really great paper. I strongly encourage you to read this. It's one of the ones I posted uh, there as well, using thematic analysis and psychology, um, where they describe these uh, six phases of thematic analysis, looking for themes in this raw data that you've just coded um, and this is basically I think I, I think of this as basically the equivalent of what these people refer to as pattern coding so that's another term you will find this uh, in the literature as thematic analysis um, there's one okay yeah so one example before uh, going deeper into this so often a technique we use to identify themes or group sets of codes into things that make sense together, into themes that sort of make sense together, um, is so-called card sorting. Um, it's what the name implies. So you know, here in this example, again, thanks to Courtney, we have, uh, we have all of these codes uh, as post-it notes, and we have teeny tiny versions of the uh, quotes that embody those codes you know on these uh, sheets of paper um, so those are the cards and now um, we're trying to create some sort of structure and come up with some higher level themes and relationships between them from this lower level data um, so the end result was something like what you see on the left hand side here so the goal of the study was to characterize the forms of toxicity language toxicity or communication toxicity in these discussions happening in open source projects um, and um, there were several themes emerging from this um, for example we talked about the nature of the toxicity you know what flavor of toxicity is it 
we another theme was the triggers of toxicity you know what led to those comments in, in the first place what caused them um, authors you know, who were these people posting these toxic comments you know what was their relationship to the projects in and uh, uh, question etc who was the target who was at the other end of this comment who were they addressing it to you know characteristics of the project etc it's like these are different dimensions or axes or themes if you will um, that aggregate these lower level codes into something that is so cohesive and makes sense together um, there is actually you know uh, i won't talk much about this here but we do in the paper go uh, to some extent also into uh, identifying relationships between these concepts right, so so far i uh, this is an example of grouping the very many low level codes that we ended up with after this coding step into some higher level structure that makes sense as it captures the you know different aspects of the phenomenon under study uh, but it's still a summarization or still descriptive step by right? we're you know describing all of the manifestations of this along these different dimensions we're not really you know as far as this diagram goes we're not really uh you know theorizing about you know what happens when you change this thing here how does it affect that other thing there etc we're not really talking about relationships between these themes and concepts and whatnot in, in this diagram here on the slide uh, we do talk a little bit more about that in the paper but that's sort of a separate step we go even one level deeper in you know theorizing and interpreting this rather than just summarizing it um, okay so let's look at a maybe more concrete example this is to illustrate that there's more than one way to go about grouping codes into themes so consider these examples of codes uh, the uppercase letter uh, codes on the slide um, and in between square uh, brackets are the kinds, the types of codes, just as an annotation. So consider these codes related to the first, first month of withdrawal symptoms described by people who quit smoking. Okay, so this is a series, you know, imagine a series of interviews with people that just quit smoking. And this are the kinds of things that came up um, when they were asked about uh, their first month of uh, quitting smoking okay so anxiety nervousness restlessness deep breathing throat burning felt like crying hurt someone bad angry eating a lot more wandering around habitual movements memories of smoking and smelling new things okay so let's say this is your input set of codes right this is a summary of your input data how might you um, group this into higher level themes so i'll show you an example you could you know very mechanically um, group these codes by their type right so you, you know all of the emotions you would group together all of the processes uh, deep breathing throat burning felt like crying, eating a lot more, et cetera, et cetera. Processes you would group together, the descriptors you would group together, and so on and so forth. Right? This would be one way of doing this, right? It's some aggregation, right? It's you know clearly a higher level structure that aggregates these lower level codes. But is this, you know, is this ideal? Or like, why, why isn't this ideal? I guess I'm leading, it's a leading question. description yeah it's boring that's one <laughs> well because because it's mechanical right because you could sort of you know do it without any any need for interpretation or synthesis um you could do you could do this mechanically yep i think you're losing a lot of information that you have in the codes like for example in the processes processes group you have potentially positive things like deep breathing and smelling new thing mixed in with throat burning, mm. which are completely different in my mind. Right. Yeah. So you're sort of, you're, you know, losing a lot of nuance and richness that was there in the data to begin with. 
uh, which you know is, is a shame, really. Yep. Any, was there something else? Did you have something? I guess it kind of depends on the study context. Like, like if you're trying to study the similarity of like research ideas and research processes, um, and you use like taking the same classes as your grouping factor, like even though like say Matt and I are in the same class and sitting very close to each other, like you could categorize this by that, but it has no bearing on the goal of your inquiry. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's thank you. That's a good example of I think the same point uh, that you're trying to make about how you know these things can still be very different semantically, uh, but they somehow get clustered together and you're losing all that uh, nuance. Right. So here is I think an example um, a different way of categorizing these that uh, to your point, distinguishes between negative and positive aspects of this, um, or, well, maybe it doesn't, right? So we could still further refine, I agree with your point, we could still further refine this, you know, in, into positive and negative physical changes in this case, um, like throat burning versus smelling new things. Um, you know, positive versus negative emotions was an attempt at doing something similar with emotions, uh, etc. So you can see, you know, just in a simple example, how there's probably, so first of all, there's all, all these multiple ways of doing this, and, and B, there's probably you know, more meaningful ways of doing this. So how do you then arrive, ideally directly, at a meaningful outcome instead of, you know, arriving at something that looks more like this? What's the magic, the secret sauce? How do you arrive at the publishable analysis, the one that ends up in the paper? How do you arrive at that directly, you know, instead of you know, iterating and workshopping it and doing stuff like that? You need to do a language model. <laughs> Yeah, no, not in this class. I mean, like, I guess I, 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 my actual answer might even like be along the same space, <laughs> but like, both of those two recategorizations feel like you've taken contextual clues from the text that are near those areas and then use those as like sort of like a meta um, coding almost. So it seems like you. I guess like it is it really just iteratively coding at higher and higher levels of, of abstraction until you get like a, a set that are all shared. Um, like if I have two separate interviews, concretely the very specific codes I use in each interview might be very very different. But if I keep abstracting based on the context of where they're supposed to occur in each interview, wouldn't I eventually get the, like the same two abstractions? Like. So, I mean, in principle, right, if you keep doing this, you will just end up with the raw code in the first place, right, because those are your unique instances of something. So that seems like a, not not the whole answer, right, because in the extreme, you just have the raw code you started from, and they're, you know, cohesive internally and unique and describe only that phenomenon, and there's no uh, conflict there, right, there's no ambiguity or whatever, they're all, you know, Semantically meaningful because they, they only refer to one instance. Yep. Is this so you need to either create or use a theory to get some sort of relation of the greater understanding of it? And I think a lot of that is based on what is your actual question. So if I was like a doctor and I'm interested in the symptom or like what's going on, I may actually prefer the more less uh, inference, the more basic list. Or with this list, this is more about like emotional and like connecting, uh, like this framing of it is uh, seem to me to come from a different research question or perspective. Yeah, so I, my answer was going to be going back to lecture one. You know, I uh, silver bullets. Like if you're looking for a silver bullet, one size fits all, golden, whatever. Uh, you won't find it. So the answer is you can't. I was going to say you don't. Right. So you do not arrive. Uh, you do not arrive at the final thing that you, you know, want to have 
in one pass. Uh, obviously, it depends on all these context factors, like what is your actual research question, et cetera, you know, that's kind of driving this. Uh, but even then, you still don't arrive at it unless through iteration and practice, right? So, you know, whoever says that, like, oh, you know, qualitative research interviews are easy. I'm not going to bother, you know, practicing or learning how to do this. It's easy. Anyone can do this. You know, you just ask some people some questions and that's it. I dare you to try that. <laughs> how many iterations did we uh, go through, Courtney, for the toxicity uh, thing? Um, do you remember? I, there were a few before I joined the project. And then after I joined it, there were at least two. OK. One more data point. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. Right. So uh, this happens very rarely, but I think you know, ideally, if you're going the whole way, you would also try to then further uh, identify relationships, ideally causal relationships between these themes that came out of your interviews. You know, so maybe here, uh, regretful loss leads to you know, feelings. Uh, of, of uh, crying and memories of smoking, which you know in turn trigger anxiety or nostalgia, and you know, people then find comfort and camaraderie with others that went through a similar experience like that. Um, this last step of you know theorizing happens very rarely. This is what uh, is typ typically referred to as grounded theory. When you're doing grounded theory, the outcome of that activity is a theory which means you know constructs and relationships between them so this last part of actually articulating these maybe causal relationships between constructs happens very rarely it's, it's really the hardest to do uh, usually we stop at some form of thematic analysis without going this extra step uh, because you know often that's enough to describe a phenomenon or a problem or a relatively unknown area etc um, you know, without going one extra step deeper into this, but this is awesome whenever you can you could do this. Here's a cool quote from some haters. <laughs> Grounded theory is often used as a rhetorical sleight of hand by authors who are unfamiliar with qualitative research and who wish to avoid close description or illumination of their methods. More disturbing, perhaps, is that it becomes apparent when one pushes them to describe their methods that many authors hold some serious misconceptions about grounded theory. So this is all to say that, you know, please don't say that you're doing grounded theory unless you're actually doing grounded theory, because someone like this will notice immediately that you know, you're lying. So don't. Here's another quote. However, in our experience, grounded theory seems increasingly to be used in a way that is essentially grounded theory like. A set of procedures of coding for coding data very much akin to thematic analysis, which is my main point for today. You know, that often what we do is some form of thematic analysis without actually going all the way to theorizing. You know, and that's okay. This is useful in very many uh, scenarios. Such analyses do not appear to fully subscribe to the theoretical commitments of a full fat grounded theory, which requires analysis to be directed towards theory development. We argue, therefore, that a named and claimed thematic analysis means researchers need not subscribe to the implicit theoretical commitments of grounded theory if they do not wish to produce a fully worked out grounded theory analysis. So, this is all to say, you know, if you're not actually doing grounded theory, which is likely, you know, just please call it thematic analysis if that's what it is. Okay. Um, this huge, people are very pedantic about this in, in review uh, where you, you know, so often you'll see papers, maybe even some of the ones we've read, I don't remember, uh, saying we've used a grounded theory approach or grounded theory-like approach to, to do whatever qualitative analysis. Even though the outcome is not an actual theory, right? So just say thematic analysis. That's okay. Just call it call it what it is. Don't claim again, right? Don't claim more than you're doing, right? Like people won't be mad that you haven't gone the extra step of theorizing, unless you're claiming that you're going the extra step of theorizing. I right? will be very happy with just the themes you've identified. 
like theorizing streaming the having the causal relationships yes but by by actually having the outcome of your analysis be a theory that, that often that we talked about theory i don't know a few lectures ago and we talked about different flavors of theory not all theories need to have causal relationships between constructs but that's a common kind of theory yeah so as long as long as your outcome is you know say a set of themes that characterize some phenomenon and you know not uh, hypotheses right which sort of instantiate the theory then it's probably not grounded the theory so what will be the, the outcome of uh, the a set of themes okay I, so this it does not imply reasoning about relationships between them and the cause and effect relationships between them it's just a way of you know, characterizing describing a particular phenomenon it's, it's more descriptive than to causal okay Right, so he, you know, here, oh yes, um, an aside, small aside, along the way, so, you know, how we talked about how do you arrive at this end result? How do you arrive at you know, whatever it might be, a uh, set of themes or a theory? How do you arrive at it? One useful thing to do along the way is called analytic memoing. Um, so you don't, you know, you don't just arrive at the final thing, but you sort of, you know, iteratively, uh, approach it and one way to do this is by by writing down these analytic memos along the way as you're analyzing your data so th this sort of you know uh, memoing is a way of uh, commenting uh, informally typically on stuff you've observed while reading and analyzing and thinking about uh, what you uh, what you've just read um, it's typically higher level analytical uh, meanings rather than just descriptive summaries because those are the codes already descriptive summaries are typically the codes um and you know you could do this at various levels you know you could do uh, assertions for example uh, overall the participants seemed engaged with the uh, copilot like tool right that could be an assertion that's part of your your memo it's a note you write on the side right it's sort of a conclusion some interpretation uh, right, because you're kind of synthesizing you know, the entire interview into this one observation, or they could be more of the hypothesis uh, of theory kind. Uh, for example, uh, having pull requests rejected can be demotivating for contributors already demoralized by low self confidence in their programming expertise. So this this sort of describes a somewhat causal relationship here, right? Or you know, could be anything in between, right? The point is, your uh, writing down some of these uh, assertions and propositions and whatever uh, you're writing down your memoing as you're analyzing data and iterating on this um, and this is a useful way that you know, this will become your end result i'll show you one example of this from the same study we used a uh, spreadsheet this is deliberately small because it's sort of not uh, doesn't really matter uh, I don't expect you to read this in detail, but what I'm trying to show you is that uh, for every you know, case in our analysis, we had these different uh, memo columns in the shared spreadsheet where each of us on the research team you know, wrote down independently uh, notes that we you know, derived after reading and thinking about those instances. Right, then, you know, we didn't all do all of them. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't, etc. But like, you know, it's a way. It was a way for us to write down these observations along the way of analyzing and interpreting the data. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about you know, what are the, the, the you know the red flags and things like this. What are the issues of credibility uh, and validity, if you will, or trustworthiness when you're doing this kind of qualitative analysis um, so there's a few possible sources of bias uh, in this it's good to be mindful of them um, one is the referred to as the holistic fallacy so this is when you're 
finding patterns when there aren't any, or seeing more into the data than, than there was. Um, elite bias is when you're putting more emphasis or weight, you're trusting more the data is collected from, from high status participants over data from, from lower status participants. Personal bias, you know, all of the things you bring as the researcher to the interpretation, you know, your politics and values and beliefs and all of those. Um, going native is when you're uh, losing your outsider perspective and you're not being an objective observer anymore, uh, but you're you know, sort of siding with uh, participants. So how do you avoid these biases? What are some things you could do to establish uh, trustworthiness in your analysis? Um, often the goal is to uh, establish confirmability. Can, can anyone else other than you confirm the findings that you're, that are the claims that you're making in this qualitative analysis study. It's somewhat easier to do that with quantitative studies because you can, you know, reanalyze the same data and so on. It's a little harder to do that with qualitative studies. So how do you do this? Um, okay, yes. So there's a three objectives to pursue here credibility, transferability, and dependability, uh, according to this uh, Guban Lincoln reference. So I'll go over each of these in turn. Okay, so credibility is when um, others, be it your collaborators or the readers or the practitioners or whoever else, when confronted with the experience you're describing as a result of your analysis, they're able to recognize it. Um, so credibility addresses the fit between people's views, your respondents, your informants' views, and your representation of them. Okay? But remember, so you're the one doing this aggregation and synthesis and summarization. Right? If you show this back to people, to, to others, including the people you interviewed in the first place, would they actually agree with your interpretation of the, that data? Okay. Or would they think it's bogus? That's sort of the idea uh, behind credibility. Um, and so there's several ways in which you might do this, including one that's super useful and very rarely used um, called member checking. Let me see if I have an example of this coming up. I can't actually, we have, uh, yeah, let me start from this. I'll go back. This is my favorite one. That's why I'm starting with this. So member checking is when you go back literally to the people that were your, the community or whatever, that were your informants for the study in the first place. So we already saw two examples of this. Uh, if you remember the Bogart uh, et al. Breaking Changes paper, they actually explicitly uh, uh, did this. So this is a quote from the paper. We presented interviewees with both the summary and a full draft of sections four to seven, which is the uh, whatever the results section where they're interpreting their, uh, their data and discussing their findings, along with questions prompting them to look for correctness in areas of agreement or disagreement, i.e. fit. Uh, and any insights gained from reading about experiences of other developers and platforms, i.e. applicability. Okay. So they literally took the results of their study and the draft of their paper, at least the relevant parts, and showed that to the people that provided the interviews in the first place to confirm that their interpretation makes sense. Right? Hardly anyone ever does this. It's awesome. The other example we saw was the sex workers paper, right, where uh, they had a uh, somebody from that community work as a paid consultant on the research project, you know, guiding them uh, at all steps, including development of the interview guide, et cetera, and sort of formulating the, the questions. All right, so that's another form, if you will, of member checking. Smartphone disconnected. Okay. Smartphone connected. 
I don't think I care. Okay. Um, so this is a really great practice, very rarely, uh, very rarely followed. Great way to um, establish credibility because you know that means that it's not just you now seeing the things you're claiming and that data you've collected, but also that this you know the people you collected the data from in the first place actually agree with your interpretation and your findings. Right, so that's a much stronger claim to be making. Uh, so you know whenever you can, you should do that. Okay, so now let me see what else I have here. Uh, Right, so that was one of the strategies. Member checking was one of the strategies to increase credibility. What else did we have? We had prolonged engagement. This means, um, you know, so don't, don't cut the study short until you've had enough time to, or the interview short until you've had enough time to collect, you know, all the data you need and to understand what's going on. Um, side note here, there was this, um, discussion for a really long time um, about the Hawthorne effect. So you've probably heard about this, that people, uh, the effect, uh, Hawthorne effect says that people alter their behavior when observed. So, you know, I, the idea behind prolonged engagement here is to counteract the Hawthorne effect, right? To actually, you know, get people to a point where uh, you can assess what is really going on rather than their sanitized, presumably, version of, of that, uh, that they're, you know, um, uh, just giving you because they know they're being observed. Um, I was looking at this uh, last time when I gave this class and reading a bit more about it, and it seemed that this is a very controversial topic in social psychology. It seems like there's very little to no evidence uh, of the uh, uh, Hawthorne effect, uh, actually, so it seems like it's more of a myth than a than a reality. So I, I don't know what the what the status is, but you know, for the longest time, people have feared this Hawthorne effect, uh, yet nobody is able to actually reproduce it uh, experimentally uh, with you know solid research methods. So that was interesting. Um, okay, persistent observation is the other side of this. So you know, prolonged engagement. Is about scope to give you an opportunity to uh, ask, uh, you know, all the relevant things. Persistent observations about depth, you know, going at enough depth um, to fully understand something. Um, triangulation is the other super common, really useful uh, way to increase credibility. Triangulation means using multiple data, multiple research methods, uh, multiple data sources, multiple whatever to obtain corroborating evidence for something you're claiming. Um, you could do this, uh, you could, we saw examples of this. We saw examples where the researchers um, did some analysis of some small set of interviews and then ran a much larger survey to validate the claims and the findings from their small scale interviews. Like that's a way of triangulating claims and findings by right, combining research methods. Um, and right, so it's sort of obvious why you might want to do this. Okay, or yeah, you could, so that was an example where they triangulate their findings using different research methods. You could also think of examples where they triangulate their findings using different data, right? So if I observe something on a population of ISR or CMU students, you know, I could triangulate my findings by also interviewing, say, Pitt students and seeing, you know, how the effects are different in that population. Right? So I'm not changing the research method. I'm still running interviews, say, but I'm doing them on a different sample, a different data set, or sample from a different population. Um, and, you know, things in between. I could have, uh, often you have multiple researchers collaborating on a project. Um, if uh, you say have two people involved in qualitative analysis, would your collaborator agree with your interpretation of that data? You know, would they arrive at similar uh, findings? You know, would they see instances of the same uh, codes wherever you see instances of the codes, et cetera? You could go really to the extreme here and you could compute measures of inter-reader agreement and things like this um, to uh, you know, show that your uh, 
interpretations of this input text, this input data are robust to the researcher doing the interpretations. Okay, and we talked about member checking. So that was all credibility, lots of things that go under credibility, right? So it's basically, you know, do, can someone reading this believe the claims you're making? That's the idea. Now, transferability is about generalizability. That's the other uh, term here. So, um, you know, would the same things you've claimed or observed on this in this context also transfer to another context? And to what extent can you reason about that? Um, you know, have you have you done anything to try to transfer some of these findings on a different population, et cetera? Um, and one strategy to increase transferability is to provide thick descriptions, good quotes to back up all of the summary interpretations you're making in your write-up. Okay, so that whoever's thinking about transferring and generalizing your findings to a different context can not only see your summary interpretations and themes and whatnot, but also the raw verbatim quotes illustrating those, supporting those points that you're making from your very participants, and you know can therefore reason more directly whether similar things are also applicable in, in the other context where they're looking to transfer this. So the idea is you know always support your write-ups with good illustrative quotes so that people can judge uh, better whether those findings might generalize to a different setting. Um, and finally, dependability um, is about clearly uh, documenting your research process and following sort of a, a logical, uh, rigorous, traceable process in doing all of this. I have, uh, well, we talked about audit trails. Uh, yeah, so here are the things, a list of things to try to maintain throughout studies like these. The raw data itself, right? Be it you know uh, recordings of interviews or raw survey results or what have you, notes that you might have taken uh, as part of this, all of the you know field notes and analytic memos and summaries and code books and all of those. Um, right. So there are various forms of that. This is. Uh, Lots of examples of the various things that might come up. Let me show you concretely things. I showed you an example of uh, uh, explicit definitions for the different codes. So that's something that we maintain as part of this process. So we kept the code book with explicit, clear, hopefully operational definitions of this. And we're, you know, we're, that's part of the, the um, audit trail that we're leaving uh, for the study. Uh, I showed you an example of these analytic memos that we wrote during the process of analyzing. You know, we, we kept all of these. Um, and then we have a very detailed description of the methodology in the paper itself to allow people to uh, you know, judge how dependable and how trustworthy this all was. And you know, we describe all of the things in, you know, in, in great detail. Um, this is an actual a screenshot from the paper so you know it takes up quite a bit of space kind of just describing this part of you know how literally how did we go about reading and interpreting these um what kinds of notes did we take what kinds of inferences did we make okay um all right a few more things for you to look at offline let me just for as an aside let me open up for a question we often talk about open science uh, especially these days um so what about qualitative studies and qualitative data though like how should you share qualitative data and, and how might you go about doing this i think you want to have in coming to your population similar to the sex worker study you want to have an expert there to review like let's say your my initial naive approach is anonymize everything and then it'll be okay but then i thought well, my definition of anonymize is probably different than someone who's in that population definition of anonymizes. So if you have that extra person who's 
giving you guidance um, on the field, then you would want to check with them. But then I, I guess that gets into the idea of whether even anonymous data is okay to release, which is something that we're going to do. So this is a good time, yeah, so. More and more, we keep finding that, like, we take away like identifiers, like, well, we can think of like anonymizing data, and then our, our data analysis like, is keep getting better and better. So, we can still identify individual people from data that we plan to be anonymized. So, it's hard to predict what data analysis that needs to accomplish in the future, but it makes it seem more possible. Yep, good point. Anyone else? Yeah, hello, I do. I was going to add that, like, for a study, I had a bunch of Reddit data, which is technically public, but I've taken this and aggregated it together based on keywords and some of it was people saying bad things and so we opted not to release it publicly and we have like a footnote in the paper that says we're maintaining this data for x number of years and if you want it please contact us and we can provide it but we're not going to provide it here because even in the case of reddit data we've taken these things and put them together so yep 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 thanks Matt. you know one of the challenges too is what are you doing is even if you can de-identify it completely, in some cases you lose so much data within the interview. I wonder if you can use for that after the future research. So, there's an argument I think to be made for uh, you know, because you know, often you're coding for uh, towards a, answering a specific set of research questions. Um, there may be a lot more useful information in those interviews in those transcripts. That could be used to answer other research questions, you know, by you or others. So somebody else having access to this, you know, could allow them to answer those additional research questions without conducting more interviews, which you know is a, a, a huge investment for both researchers and participants. So you know, maybe there's an argument about how this could enable more research on other things, in addition to enabling, you know, more uh, dependability, verifiability of the things you're claiming yourself yeah any, any more thoughts on releasing this sharing yay nay maybe it also depends on uh your irb protocol by the way so we didn't really talk much about this i promised someone that i would talk more about irb uh and then i didn't end up doing it so um I guess we could talk a teeny tiny bit now, but maybe more later. Um, whenever you're doing anything that involves humans and or data from humans, be it publicly um, archived data about humans, um, you need to first go through uh, the, some ethics review board at your local university, uh, in our case, the IRB office at CMU, uh, and you have to so submit a study protocol for their approval before you do any of the data collection and obviously any of the analysis. Um, and you know their role is to um, try to ensure that you're not exposing your participants to unreasonable risks uh, for you know while participating in your research study risks that they would not otherwise be exposed to on a you know day-to-day -day basis already um, so you know there's some baseline level of risk that is assumed to be okay like you know if they have to uh, i don't know uh, participate in person in an interview and they have to leave their house to get to the university, say, to meet with you so you can interview them or whatever, uh, you know, there's a risk that, I don't know, their car is going to break down or they're going to get in a car accident or things like this, you know, that's assumed to always be there, but uh, your study is not really increasing that baseline level of risk, but, you know, other, other risks that could really harm them, like, you know, uh, are you harming their uh, privacy in, in some way or, or things like this? So we have this requirement, right, for all studies, including studies that involve analyzing public artifacts that people have left on the internet, even if you're not directly talking to them or something like that, because of risks like these of, you know, aggregating and disclosing things about participants that might not have already been public, for example, and might end up harming them in some way, um, 
we have this requirement to go through an IRB approval here and, and elsewhere. Uh, all universities in the United States have this. Um, many universities around the world have this. Um, and I guess we, maybe we do this uh, offline. So I'll, I'll send out some more instructions for, you know, how uh, how you might do this at CMU if you haven't done this already. Uh, there's some training that you have to go through. So it's always a good idea to do that training and just to have it uh, there. It uh, stays valid on file for some number of years. You can use that uh, training for any subsequent protocols that you'll be submitting. I'll follow up. This sounds like a lengthy discussion. So I'll follow up with more pointers uh, offline for people that want to do this uh, in the short term, you might also want to do this. So, if you're designing now mixed method studies, you know, be it experiments of sorts or stuff that involves interviews or surveys or whatever, um, all of this stuff in, in principle requires IRB uh, approval before you can actually do any of this. So, it's a good time to start prepping for that, you know, getting the protocol approved, you know, putting the study materials together, et cetera, uh, getting your training done, all of this stuff, you know, is better than early than late. Okay, uh, more on that separately. Uh, yeah, and I guess the point is to also get consent from one other thing, get consent from participants. So, you know, if you're interviewing people um, and you record this, whatever, you know, transcripts and whatnot, and you then release them without telling them at the time that you are going to do this, that's a really bad practice, right? Because, you know, maybe they wouldn't have told you the things they told you, even if confidentially or anonymously, um, if you told them up front that you were going to publish this you know, transcript verbatim or something like that, you're going to share the recording with other people, right? So, you know, always get consent. Okay, so just to wrap this up, uh, roughly three approaches to qualitative content analysis. Um, the first one, the conventional content analysis, is what we talked about all day today in class. This is also what I refer to as thematic analysis. Um, this is when you usually start with some observations and define codes bottom up during the analysis. You know, iteratively refine the code book as you're collecting more data, et cetera. Um, but the codes are derived from the data, so bottom up, and they are not predefined before you start the study. Uh, there are also a couple of other uh, forms of qualitative content analysis, um, the more deductive flavor, uh, starting from theory and uh, predefined codes and so on, uh, predefined keywords. We didn't really talk about those. They're less common. I suspect you will less often be doing those than this one, which is probably the most common. So, so thematic analysis, conventional content analysis. Um, some things to keep in mind, you know, what some decisions that you'll have to make along the way, what comes as a theme, you know, is it some low level thing? Is it some high level thing? Does it have to be supported by tons of instances or, you know, make, can it be supported by just one example, one quote, you know, is, is that a theme? Is that too small? Uh, you know, all of these are decisions that you'll have to make. Remember those that there's no magic uh, rule here. There was some comment before uh, in a previous lecture about trying to use interviews to quantify frequency of phenomena. It's usually not the what you're doing with interviews. Um, so you know the keyness of a theme probably depends not on how frequently it occurs in your sample of interviews, but rather you know if it captures something important in relation to the overall research question. So you should always keep that in mind, not you know raw frequency in, in the data. Um, do you try to provide a rich description of all of the data you've collected, or do you choose to focus on one particular aspect? You know, that's one decision you'll have to make. Often, uh, interviewees will talk about probably irrelevant things for your research questions. So, you know, you want you'll probably want to focus on the, the stuff that's of particular interest. Um, we talked a little bit about this about how it's useful to have this progression from descriptive things, just describing the data to more interpretation where you're you know, arriving at higher level abstractions, relationships between them, et cetera. Ideally, you can theorize about the significance of the patterns and the broader meanings and implications beyond just purely describing their presence in the data. Um, right, so that often that's also a distinction between inductive and theoretical thematic analysis. 
Um, we talked about a bunch of pitfalls and how you might avoid them. Uh, hopefully you have a better sense now of how to do this. Uh, here's for future reference, a 15 point checklist of criteria for good thematic analysis. You can find us here. Um, okay, and that's it. Let's stop here. We'll do an analysis uh, of some example transcripts uh, together next time on Thursday. We'll start with that.